The other handout that I have in the network folder is called Client Marketing Strategy. So I'm talking in general terms of these concepts of blogging and uh, social media and marketing and all of that. And here I have this handout that I think helps you kind of understand what you're in store for. If you open that up, it's not just that we get dive head first into writing, blogging, or using social media. We have to have a plan. So marketing is a, is a, is a degree that you can earn. You have a degree in marketing, for example. So obviously in the small amount of time we have to talk here, we can't become marketing experts. Uh, I do talk about this also more in the SEO class. And even in that, it's still not enough to get all the nuances. The Social Media Examiner website has some great articles on marketing, web marketing, and then also um, search engine land. So there's always more to learn. But this gives you a starting point. Uh, this would be something that I might give in an assignment, as an assignment in another class. Uh, I would teach, for example, at Southwestern College, my SEO class, most of my classes at Southwestern College are credit classes. You earn credits. Therefore, there's grades and assignments and all of that. And on most of the classes that I do here at North City, it's all open enrollment. No grades, no assignments, but you get no units or credits or anything. So in that other class, I would have people fill this out and turn it in, and then we'd discuss it and refine it. In this class, I'll give you an overview of it where you would fill in the name of your company, your name, the date, because this is a strategy that could change as time goes on. Like in that other class, we would review it throughout the semester to focus on the business. There's a lot of creative people in those classes where even you know, out of high school, a lot of them have ideas of what kind of business, you know, a lot of self-starters. Uh, my business is all about repairing broken iPhones or, uh, you know, paying, getting paid to, to tweet for a company. So they have ideas, and you have an idea for your business, so this will help to um, figure out what you're trying to do, what's your strategy, how are you going to use your tools to reach your goal. The first question is, what do you want to accomplish? Are you selling something, building awareness? simply writing or being creative, artistic, what, what are you trying to do with your online presence? So once that's defined, you can do these other things. I have this example, Vic.co wishes to uh, create a powerful social media presence because we want to interact with existing customers and through word of mouth, mouth reach new customers. We want to connect with people on Instagram in a very visual way. That could be expanded, that could be changed. What are you trying to do online? Here this fictional company is saying, well, we want to use Instagram. We want to be very visual. On another handout that I give in the class, Vic.co basically is a web design company. So they are a fictional company trying to get hired to make websites. So there, uh, that could be part of the accomplishments here. But I'm saying reaching new customers, doing tech support for current customers using Instagram. All of these questions in this handout are most likely you're not going to figure them out in one sitting. You're not going to really define your target audience, for example, by thinking about it for 10 minutes. All of these things, these concepts, if, if you are doing marketing in a very high-level way, these need to really be figured out. I use this as an example for the classes, but I would also use it, use it as an example for clients. If my company is going to get hired to make their realty website really work for them, we need to know, my company would need to know as much as possible about the client to do as much as we can right for the client. 
So something as simple as, okay, you've hired us to make your website or run your social media, but we need to figure out what's the whole point of you getting online. Sometimes a company says, well, I thought I had to, or everyone tells me I should, but that's not good enough. Why do you want to be online? What do you try to accomplish? Is, is, is your online presence for just for show, or it's going to let you do something? To make more sales and such. Let's say the example of Vic.co, trying to accomplish there, sell cupcakes. So my website and all my social media and everything, the in, all my endeavors, the goal is to sell baked goods to people visiting my site. Once I figured that out, I can do more. And I can have a primary goal, secondary, tertiary, as much as I want, but uh, I want to be specific. It's being specific with the target audience as well. Who are you trying to reach? Who's going to care about your business, your product, your website, your Twitter, your Facebook? Who's going to care? Who's going to um, really click or, or buy? Uh, in this case, we would create a persona. We would create a fictional person but of a, a, a believable, fictional person. Uh, questions such as, uh, who are the people that would like to know about your product, their age, their gender, economic group, musical style, you know, wh wh who's this person? Even though you're inventing a person, it's based on who you're trying to reach. Who would respond more to your blog posts, who would search for them, who would click buy, I have the example of in, in the real world, a few years ago, someone came to my company to ask for a website and all of that. And then, of course, we asked them, who's your target audience? Who's going to buy your product? I said, well, everyone. Everyone wants this. That, of course, is the, wrong, is the wrong answer. Because what they're selling were baby strollers. So no, not everyone would want that. And no, not every parent would want that. And no, not everyone, even at a certain age of their child, would want it. Eventually, through some work, we figured out that the target audience were first-time parents, first-time Latino parents. That's who their target audience was. They obviously can sell that baby crib to, to anyone, or the baby stroller, whatever it was, but they're focusing on that audience to write their tweets specifically to them, to write their blog posts specifically to them, to design a website specifically to them, so that they can click buy. So the answer to who is your target audience is not everyone. You know, these are the best hamburgers ever. Uh, these are the best hamburgers ever. Everyone's going to want them. No, not vegans. No, not, not those that are, you know, cutting down on, on you know, meat consumption, whatever. You know, not everyone is going to want that. You're going to want people that want a high-quality hamburger with natural ingredients, with... Uh, the right cost, whatever. You have to figure out the person. This is what the big companies do. Um, what do Dasani, Water, Powerade, and Coca-Cola have in common? Same company. Yeah, owned by the same company. That one company then is selling you, for, t for some target audience, the Powerade drink, or the Coca-Cola, or the water. You know, those that want uh, the sports drink to help them after their workout, there's your drink. Those that want the classic taste of that beverage, there's your product. Those that just want plain water, there's your product. So one company differentiated to the, all their target audiences. Same company. So you have to figure out who is your target audience. And of course you can deviate and reach any audience, but that's part of the problem why a company doesn't succeed they haven't focused. Who are they trying to reach? Who are they trying to sell to? Once that's figured out, you can then try, uh, go to that goal. Part of the way that you succeed is by also checking the competition, aspirational competition. So it's good to have role models both in life and in business. Is there a business you see that makes you think, I want to be like that? Or a business that makes you think, I want to do that, but better? 
So you list a person or a company or whatever that you're in competition with. So you can check them out. You can do competitor analysis. You can see what they're doing, what works for them. Then figure out a version, a variation of what you can do, not stealing their techniques, but based on what they're doing, figure out what you can do to set you apart. Uh, this client, that uh, Mexican food client that I mentioned, uh, when we set this up for them a few years ago and we asked them, who is your aspirational competition? Who do you aspire to be or surpass? They said Phil's Barbecue. Now, if you've heard of Phil's Barbecue, it's a pretty famous San Diego barbecue restaurant. And you would think, well, this is Mexican food, this is barbecue, American barbecue. This client is lamb, that's the meat, and over here it's beef. doesn't sound like it's competition. It doesn't have to be direct competition that this Mexican restaurant is in competition with this Mexican restaurant. It is that this restaurant is in competition with this restaurant because also they're aspiring to be like the other one. They want a line out the door with a 40-minute wait. You know, if you go up there, you see a little sign that says there's a 40-minute 40, 40 wait from this point. So the, the our client wants that. They want to have a line out the door. And on the weekends, they do. On the weekends, they have a waiting list to get into that restaurant, but they want that every day of the week, like Phil's Barbecue, like whatever competition. So you have to define your company, but who else are you competing with? Because unfortunately, you're not the only realtor. You're not the only fencing company. You're not the only skydiving company. You're not the only dog walker. You're not the only whatever. Even if you think you're, you're very specific, very unique, there's other competition, either nearby or far off, but there's competition. Understanding what they do and what they do well helps you understand what you could do better. We have a vision statement. There's also, in contrast, a mission statement. You might have heard that, mission statement. Mission statement tells the world where your company stands right now. A vision statement tells the world where your company is going or what it's going to do. So you would write a statement with like a prediction, what you're trying to do. Mission statement is, Victor's Bakery, uh, our goal is to provide the best treats, uh, healthy treats for your family. You know, that's our mission. What are we doing now? Our goal is, you know, trying to be well known for this, trying to reach uh, more of an audience, trying to give back to the community. What's your vision? What's your end goal? Or what are you reaching toward eventually? This example, Vic.co, will be known for providing eye-catching web design for San Diego's most elegant restaurants. So the mission statement for that one could have been Vic.co is passionate about making great websites. That's the mission statement. But the goal eventually is that it's going to be a focus on San Diego elegant restaurants, making websites that focus on restaurants elegant restaurants, high-end restaurants, focused in San Diego. Vic.co could make websites for any kind of business here or San Diego or New York or London. But this is our vision. That's what we want to do to focus on. This again goes back to who's your target audience, everyone? That's the wrong answer. You want to focus on an audience. The vision is again a goal of what you're trying to do, what your business is trying to be to accomplish. And you can have a time horizon in that how long will this take? Five years, two years, ten years, whatever. And then we have the unique selling proposition, the USP. What do you provide your customers that no one else can? What makes you stand out from the rest? How do you uniquely solve their problems? And answer the question of why, why would they hire you? What makes you unique? I can get any other web designer. I can go to any other bakery. I can get any other uh, daycare center. What makes you unique? And this one is often very hard to answer. Because yes, I am another web designer. I am another daycare. I am another bakery. This one is the hardest one for people to figure out. In this example, I'm trying to say that the people behind this company 
our local people. We grew up here. We, we went to school here. We live here. We know the culture. We're trying to reach San Diego companies. We have people from San Diego in our company. We understand the local scene. That could be a way that makes us unique. Someone is trying to decide between hiring us and hiring us, hiring someone from LA. Well, maybe that's enough for for the why that we 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 reach the right audience. So the unique selling proposition. What's what's unique about you? This handout can can change. Um, it can be hard to define the first time. But uh, I, I give you this handout, and if you decide to work on it, I would recommend saving a copy of it before you make changes. Save one uh, in, on your flash drive and keep that one, but then make a copy of it. You can do save as, and make a copy to work on that other version. Well, if you start working on this one right now and you ever want to start over, oh, you, uh, this handout. Oh, okay. So just make a copy of this handout to, if you, in case you want to start over at some point, once you get more knowledgeable, that way you don't have one that you're already filled in, you, have, you can start over. Okay, so there's a lot of theoreticals here. But any any questions on the concepts in this handout? So another aspect of um, marketing. We've been talking about all of these ideas and we've been um, talking about different social networks. The social network classes that I'm going to be offering on Fridays are going to be much more in-depth. What I want to do, the last thing, is kind of give you a very quick crash course on some concepts regarding social media and the way we'll do this so that we can all be on the same page is <coughs> together I'll ask us to create a new account on Mastodon that social network that I was mentioning so let's try this out go ahead and on your web browser go to the address mastodon dot social not dot com dot social mastodon dot com is taken so they have their network on mastodon.social. So instead of kind of focusing on LinkedIn or Facebook or whatever, the thing, the kind of like the big secret about social media is there's a lot of overlap. You do a lot of the same things on every network. You create a profile, as I'll show you. You set up biography. You set up uh, links, and then you get active. You do things. All of the networks have the same sorts of basic things over and over and over, with a different sort of interface and with nuances, yes. I'm gonna write notes here that social media all social networks are the same with some variations. I'll have profiles with a URL or an address. Uh, all of them have biographical info. I'll let you share or post to the network post something such as 
text, links, pictures, video, basically all networks that you do this. Uh, some little bit different here and there. For example, sound, an audio file, like, a, like a re an audio recording, you can post that on Twitter, but not quite on Pinterest, I believe. Instagram, definitely not. Instagram is picture or video. So there's differences, but they overlap a lot. They also let you be active, such as comment or reply. Uh, let me back up. Uh, first of all, like. Facebook has that thumbs up, which was the only one for a long time. Until recently, you could do some other sorts of actions, right? You can do like the little uh, sad face or the scared face or whatever. You can do these different kinds of actions besides a like on Facebook now. On Twitter, on Twitter what you could do was uh, you could favorite something. Now they call it a like. On Google+, Plus, their special term for the same idea is to plus one, to give it a plus one, to like it. Different terms, same thing. You can like something on all the networks. On Instagram, you double tap the photo, it gives it a heart, it gives it a like. You can comment or reply to everything posted or shared, and you can also reshare. If you see something you enjoy on Facebook, you can do all of these things. You see someone else's photo, you can like it. You can comment on it. You can share it to show to more people, your friends and family. You can do all of these things, and your uh, and people can do that to your account. People can like your posts, comment on your posts, reshare your posts. All of these you want you want on your content, your posts. I number them here in their value. A like, someone liking your content is nice, but it's sort of a, a bit of a dead end. Someone likes, that's it, they move on. What else is there today? Let me like something else. The next level of value is a comment. Your content is so good, someone took the time to comment. Maybe something meaningful, maybe something short like great job or something, but they took a little more effort to comment. That person that commented on your content is a little bit more valuable to you, as we'll see, compared to the one that just liked. That's very transitory, minimal. And a reshare is even more valuable because that means someone liked your content so much that they basically copied and pasted it or forwarded it to more people. They shared it to more people. So let's say I've only got 10 followers on Twitter. Um, someone sees my tweet and reshares re it, which on Twitter is called a retweet. But then that person had a thousand followers. So I reached now the 10 plus the thousand that were reshared, a thousand ten people. In other words, that's a bit of why they, they call it going viral. I have these followers, followers of followers, friends of friends, that got my content to more people. That's why that's a higher level. Three, it has more value. Someone did that, that's even better. The fourth level, the highest value of activity on social media is a follow. I want to follow. I want to build an audience. There's your captive audience, who you're marketing to. The 10 friends that I have on Facebook are my target audience. The uh, 50 followers on Twitter is my target audience, my captive audience. The 1,000 fans I have on, on uh, Pinterest, that's my target audience, captive audience. That billboard that you see on the highway, on the 5, a lot of people see that billboard. Let's say I paid X amount of money for that billboard. A lot of people see it, especially between 2 p.m. and 5 p.m. when you know the traffic is really bad. A lot of people look at it and stare at that billboard, and some amount of them will follow through. There's a phone number on that billboard to hire me as a plumber. 
but a thousand people a day, 10,000 people, I don't know, a lot of people a day will see that billboard, but a very small amount of people will, will actually follow through. Not until I need a plumber. Building an audience, building followers on social media is like that, but better because they've chosen to follow you, your content. They, they do want to follow you as a plumber or as a blogger or whatever and keep up to date. Every time you've got a new post on Pinterest, on Instagram, they see it. That's the value of follow. That's why we want to always build followers on social media. It's my captive audience. All of these are valuable. Number four is the most captive audience. So I'm not saying likes are bad. The only one that's bad here is no activity. I share this stuff and no one cares. No one does any of that. That's bad. But all of these are valuable. We'll see how in a moment. But all of this is the idea of social media. I want to use any one of them. Notice generically this applies to Facebook, to Twitter, to Mastodon, to Snapchat, to all of them to various degrees. That's why all the big companies are on every network. Taco Bell is on Snapchat. Nike is on Twitter. Uh, Johnson & Johnson is on Facebook. Every company, Delta, is on uh, you know, uh, Google+, Plus, whatever. Every company is on every network because they're trying to reach an audience to complete their goal. For the example here, we'll try it on Mastodon. So Mastodon is a free, open source social network, a decentralized alternative to commercial platforms that avoids the risk of single company monopolizing your communication. So basically what this is saying is this came up in response to the current networks, which, you know, the ugly truth is that we're using all of these networks, but we're playing on someone's playground. We're playing inside of the Facebook playground. We're on the Twitter playground. Therefore, we have to follow their rules. And so we're also at their whim of advertising. In the beginning, none of these social networks had any ads. You just logged in, chatted with your friends, that's it. Now there's an ad every few tweets. There's an ad on the side constantly on Facebook. There's an ad in between my Instagram photos. Ads, ads, ads. Well, they make the companies make their money on ads. But a lot of people were very tired. So many ads. I just want to connect with my friends and family. This network, one of the big things about it is that there's no ads. And they claim they will never put ads on the network. So how do they get the money? Right now, they get their money by donations. You can donate to the networks to keep it running. Uh, can you explain a little bit about this website? Because I have seen different kind of this website. Mm. Yeah, I will be different instances. I will be talking about it once we, once we create it in a moment. So the big draw with this network is that they they're not going to put ads. They also claim that they're a little bit more trustworthy in terms of whenever you sign up for the other networks, they take your email and they do stuff with it. Here they don't. So privacy and no ads and such. Uh, the thing about Mastodon that's also unique is that it says it's decentralized, meaning when you go to twitter.com, you're basically going to the server, the computer, at the Twitter company. So your data, your information is in Twitter's hands, is in Facebook's hands, in one company. And they can decide to do what they want with it, basically. Mastodon is decentralized in that different organizations can create a version of Mastodon in what they call an instance. Technically, any person can create an instance of Mastodon and have people sign up and create the network and such. Um, Mastodon.social is an instance. Mastodon.xyz is a different instance. It's run by different people, actually. You can read all of this under the about. If I look at about this instance, mastodon.social compared to mastodon.xyz, mastodon.social is run by uh, Eugène. He is the, the one that, that created the very first Mastodon software. He's running this instance of Mastodon with these rules. 
the following types of content will be removed. Excessive advertising, uncurated, uncurated news bots. So those are the rules in this playground. 65,000 users here. The one over here is run by the Kinrar, 9,000 users. These are their rules on their ones right here. We're going to remove you for racist, sexist, homophobic messages, parodic accounts. So, Victor, you, you could take this thing, this face and put it on your blog, right? Mm -hmm. Creating your own instance of priorities for people who come to blog to comment. Short answer, yes, but longer answer, it's it's a little technical and complex to set up your own Mastodon instance. Okay. But you could, yes, you could create your own Mastodon instance and have your own playground and set up your own rules and set it up however you want. You can see a list of all the ones over here under other instances on the home page here. Uh, so, okay, before I go to that, other things. It's kind of like Twitter, but it gives you 500 characters instead of 140. You can have animated graphics. You can do you can do on your on your messages. You can do a read more, so you can have a little bit of text and then read more. Not all 500. Um, ethical design, no ads, no tracking, stuff like that. Time is our chronological. People had a big fit when Twitter decided to change themselves, like Facebook, in that in the old days, Facebook and Twitter used to show you the newest messages first and the oldest messages last. Chronological. Makes sense. But now Twitter and Facebook and all the networks are showing you uh, a, a timeline. I forget what, they, what the euphemism is for it, but they're showing you a timeline that they think you will like better. How do they know what I will like? You know, they're Honestly, they're just trying to show you things to market to you more. Mastodon is always chronological. The newest messages are first, the oldest are last. Funny thing, Mastodon also, Twitter calls them tweets. Mastodon calls them toots. So when you use Mastodon, you're tooting. And on Twitter, you're tweeting. Uh, other instances here. So, Mastodon.social, Mastodon.cx, Mastodon.network, and sometimes I don't even have the name Mastodon, such as awu.space. Uh, so there's another list here that I like better that also has... It's, you can also do this if you click here, Instances of Mastodon at the top. This one also shows you kind of a random one. Uh, showing you the number of users. Someone right here, eletask.club, has 557 users. I can join that one and have a smaller community. Social.becauseofprog.fans, 13 users. Gadgetinpocket.net, 118. So one of the, this is one of the interesting things about Mastodon and also the thing that's kind of weird. Um, you can join one instance and communicate with anyone anywhere else. Um, it's just confusing, like, what's the difference between this one and this one? It's just about the users and what are, what is their, what are their terms and their rules. You know, what are the big rules under this one? It'll tell you what's good and bad to do there. Noagendasocial.com, what's good there? They tell you what they're about. There's this list over here. If you look at it at the top here, list of all instances, they list it here. You can look at number of users, column. So Mastodon has become very popular in the last few months, they don't have the huge amount of users like the other networks, but from a network that started with zero in October, over here, there's 159,000 on this instance, and 128,000 here, 65,000 on the, on the original one, friends.nico, this amount, mastodon.cloud, So 
So on the original one here, there's just a lot of um, a lot of rules. But anyway, uh, we'll go back to mastodon.social. It has you create the account, username, email address, password, confirm. Um, uh, you can you can create an account right now and make it up completely, fill it in all completely fake. That'll be fine, just for you to see how this works, um, or fill it in for real if you want to keep it. So maybe I'll just uh, Victor zero one. Fill in anything you want, get started. Okay, wait a minute. Uh, this one does require you to click your email. Hmm. Forgot about that. Some of these networks you can make it up fake and it'll let you in. This one wants you to confirm an email. I put a fake email so that won't work. Um, Well, since we are getting toward the end of the day, and this is going to be a longer discussion, maybe just up to this point, I'll, I'll just lead you up to here that this is another social network that might be useful to you. The idea is that all of them have these concepts. Once you do it on one network, you can do it on one network. You can, yeah. I've seen uh, all the languages here, basically. So uh, there's no limit. And how we can search about these groups, because it takes a lot of time to find them. It does. At the moment, there isn't any easy way to find the right one. There's just one big list. You can it, doesn't, it doesn't mean anything. Yeah, it doesn't really tell you what's that about until you click. So there's no, there's no easy way. The way I would do this is, is by looking at the users. How many? You know, if it's too small, if it's 200, I think that's too small. These that are in the thousands are better because you could reach more people. But still, I don't know what this one's about, so you have to click and click about and then read it. So there's no easy way at the moment to find all the information. So the social media classes that I'll be talking about later will go into more detail about how do I get followers, how do I interact, and all of that. I would recommend looking at that social media examiner site and checking out their articles because they'll give you information too. But uh, I wanted to show you this in case Mastodon becomes very important. Um, I mentioned to people in the other class that it's always a good idea to claim the name of your business on these networks that no one else does. At the very least, if you grab your name there, no one else will. So you may set this up for your business and maybe never use it, but then no one else can use it. This is very common now that Facebook is over a decade old and Twitter is also 10 years old. If I wanted to get Victor's Bakery on Twitter, it was probably taken seven years ago. And someone else has it, I can't take it. Even, unfortunately, if it's a dead account, if they haven't logged in in five years, these networks, these other networks, the annoying thing is they don't, you know, they don't take away the names of accounts that are not active. I want to use Victor's Bakery, it's my family business. Uh, but someone else took it and they haven't used it in five years. There's really no easy recourse for that. So at least you would grab the name, scoop it up before someone else does. So I think we'll, we'll wrap up the main lecture, but we've got a lot of ideas to work with, not just the website. We have SEO, we have blogging, we have social media, take the other classes for more details. Any questions on, uh, on topics we've talked about throughout the, throughout the course? You have my email. You can email me if you get any other questions later on, and uh, we can discuss it.